it's easy to answer the question from a Catholic perspective, why you confess your sins to a priest. Why does this thing exist where you go to confession and you say things you've done wrong and a priest says you're forgiven? That it, that's not hard to explain why that happens. What's more interesting, I think, for, for me, and hopefully for you, especially if you're a non-Catholic Christian, like an evangelical, a Protestant viewer of this show, is not just, okay, why do we do that? But what are the deep biblical Old Testament, New Testament roots of the idea of confession, of reconciliation, of repentance, of penance. Where do these things come from that then are found in sacramental form in the Catholic Church? And hey, while we're at it, what's a sacrament to begin with? Okay, this is a fabulous conversation with Dr. James Prothero on the idea of reconciliation, on the sacrament of reconciliation, a, a commonly called confession. What is it? Where are its roots? Where does it come from? Is this a pattern we see in how God works through the history of salvation of his people? Spoiler alert, yes it is. And Dr. James Prothero, a guy who knows the Bible better than anybody I think I have ever talked to, whether it be evangelical or Catholic, is here just to pull verses out of absolutely nowhere in beautiful, eloquent form and, and explain to us really the history of reconciliation from the deep biblical roots. Guys, this is an amazing conversation. Not just why we confess our sins to a priest, but what are the deep biblical roots of that pattern of reconciliation, repentance, penance, and confession? Please watch, and I hope you enjoy this. Hey friends, welcome back to the show. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Guys, if you're watching on YouTube, thank you for joining our growing community there. Uh, please subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell so you're notified every week when new conversations come out. And please uh, do interact in the comments, for better or for worse, you guys. It's always fun to engage in there. And thank you for being there. If you're listening on podcasts, thank you for listening. Uh, you can watch us too, by the way. Uh, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify, uh, please do leave a rating or review. That helps to push the podcast out to new people and get the conversations like this one to a wider audience. Guys, I am thrilled to uh, be joined this week by Dr. James Prothero. He is, amongst other things, an assistant professor of scripture and theology at the Augustine Institute, a wonderful place uh, over there, and the author of a fantastic book in the uh, Catholic Biblical Theology of the Sacraments series, The Bible and Reconciliation, Confession, Repentance, and Restoration. I am thrilled to have you on the show, uh, Dr. Prothero. Thank you for being here. Welcome uh, and hello. Hi, thanks so much for having me on. I, I've got to say, first of all, fantastic volume. This is a wonderful book. I I received it uh, over the weekend, I think on Friday. It's already quite dog-eared, I'm ashamed to say, and full of sticky notes and stuff as I was reading through it. I I am one of those kind of uh, fastidious people who keep my books like, quite neat and quite tidy, but one, if it, if it work through it too much too uh too vigorously as i did it gets worn out just but just by by you know by by use and so your book is already well used dr Prothero. it's just it's brand new so uh that's a good testament i think to your book and the other thing is this, i don't i don't want to also inflate your ego too much this is the cordial catholic we're supposed to be humble and kind of uh, you, you know a, a good a good catholic virtue of just kind of you know humble uh humble charity. But I got to say, it's been about five years of doing this show. And one of the very early topics that a number of uh, listeners wrote in, uh, emailed, uh, commented on, asking me to get somebody on to talk about was reconciliation, was confession. Uh, and it has been, uh, you know, five years of keeping my ear to the ground, looking for uh, good works on that topic that didn't just tackle kind of the low hanging fruit of, you know, well, why do you confess your sins to a priest? Why can't you just go to Jesus? Right, that is is commonly the, the the trope that the Catholic might hear, kind of in the trenches, right? But somebody who treated this, uh, looking at the Bible, looking at Scripture, looking at the, the roots of our faith, and where these kind of things came from, and so I got to say, in the five years I've been I've been watching and waiting, Doctor Prother, when your book came across my desk, I leapt for joy because here's a book. That does, that does just that. You're treating the topic, the sacrament of reconciliation, you're treating it from a deep biblical root. And I think to build those bridges of understanding with non-Catholic Christians who are looking into the Catholic faith going kind of, what, what are they doing over there? 
right? This is the exactly the place to start, not just that kind of surface treatment of this topic, but the, the digging deep into the roots, into the Old Testament, New Testament, scriptural roots of reconciliation and repentance and confession. So, I mean, kudos to you for, <laughs> for a wonderful work on this. Uh, and, and really, Thank you for kind of helping me to end that search and bringing this to our guests. I'm, I'm thrilled for this topic. So, so thank you so much for, for your hard work uh, on this topic, Dr. Prothro. Oh, thanks. I, uh, I, I appreciate the encouragement. It's, um, uh, you know, I had uh, 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 talked to somebody recently who read the book, who's a, who's a uh, uh, catechist in a parish. And um, she had finished the book and she told me, she said, well, you know, I bought this book because I thought I was just going to get more like good defense points, sure, some attack yeah, yeah. points, right? Some of, some of that low hanging stuff that's that's really important to people in the trenches, right? You know, she's got she's teaching kids who are in confirmation, but they've got yeah, one yeah. non Catholic or anti Catholic parent. Like she wants some of those kinds of things, and um, I said, well, you know, did you find it helpful? And she said, well, I did, but actually, that's not what I found was helpful, right? Since you go through the whole drama of mercy from like kind of beginning to end. She said, uh, I have some of those proof texts now, but more importantly, what I'm going to do is rewrite the whole curriculum that I teach yeah. confession <laughs> with, right? To really put everything into, into the big picture. So that's, um, uh, I, I hope that for whatever my book is worth, that it's able to, to do that for some people. Um, yeah, it, yeah. it certainly was part of my process going through it. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. And truly that that's the, really, because I was, and honestly, this is, I don't know, this is pulling the curtain back maybe too far, but I was searching for something that did that did this. I, I, I didn't want to bring someone on that was kind of like, oh yeah, well, here's the different scriptural, uh, you know, proof texts of why we confess sins to our priests and where the sacrament comes from. And Jesus said this here, I would, you know, this is a much more fulsome treatment of this that digs deep into the, well, here's, here's the Old Testament roots of this idea of repentance. I, I, I love this. So I think I want to begin on the ground floor by, because I think maybe the first hurdle to kind of overcome is the idea of a sacrament, right? And this whole, this is one uh, an entry in the series on the sacraments, uh, kind of the biblical perspective of, you know, would Catholics have sacraments in the church? But looking from the outside, say for that, you know, non-Catholic Christian, and, and I, you know, myself as an evangelical Christian before I, before I had my own conversion experience, would look at my Catholic friends who are going in this case, very rarely, very infrequently, the guys that I knew were going into a little box, talking to a guy, telling them things that they did wrong. And the guy was somehow saying, okay, you're forgiven. That was like, that was bordering on, on weird pagan, strange idolatry, kind of like all wrapped up in kind of a weird perspective on the, no, like Jesus forgives sins. Jesus, you know, you know, is the one you you pray to and ask for forgiveness. What's that priest doing there? What's going on in that situation? Why? I had no, and many non-Catholic Christians have no context for the idea of of sacraments. So I wonder if we can just kind of begin there at the at the you know thirty thousand foot perspective, and just answer that question first. What is it when talking about a sacrament? What the heck's a sacrament to begin, to begin with? Is that can we start there? Yeah, absolutely. This is uh, this is great because I uh, um, uh, my my uh, we our morning devotions with our kids um, just finished uh, uh, over the weekend. Our like little like our current rotation in our current children's Bible. You know, we've got several of those, and so we jumped into a little um, sacramental catechesis. So a sacrament, as I told the kids this morning. Yeah, yeah tell the ki- tell the kids out- <laughs> is an outward or visible sign yeah. <laughs> instituted by Christ to give us his uh, saving and especially his sanctifying grace, right? And, and grace here, not just his niceness or his favor, although it comes out of that, right? But but actually the, the Holy Spirit within us um, to bring us to uh, more, uh, to better imitate Christ, uh, to uh, live with his own life and love within us um, uh, and to be more more closely connected to him. Yeah. Um, and, and I... Uh, uh, I suppose I would say uh, I would say two things to somebody who kind of is coming at it from that sort of perspective, right? Like, what's a sacrament? What the heck's going on? Isn't this weird, right? Isn't 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 God kind of above all these things? Why do we need Why do we need a visible sign, right? 
Um, and, and I'd say two things. The first thing I would I would want to say is, right, so the, the specific ways we do some of the sacraments, like confession, right, re, re, you, you to, to know, like, well, well, like, why do you do it this way? Why do you do it this way? Why do you do it this way? There's a whole lot of biblical foundation for it, but there's also some historical stuff, right? Confession itself has taken different forms across the centuries. And even today, it's slightly different if you go into an Eastern Rite Church versus yeah, a yeah. Roman Rite Church. Not fundamentally different so the same thing is happening but but a little bit different um so uh, i would want to start with that but but then to say um the number one thing as a as a biblical christian that that i would want to do right and and i and i'm counting myself here right so i'm not i'm not saying somebody else is a biblical christian but i'm a catholic as a biblical christian and one of the reasons that i am catholic right uh, in reading scripture um, is that I want to make sure to take God at his promises. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I want to say yes and take Jesus seriously if he makes a promise that pertains to my salvation. And and maybe I'll have to work out and, and my faith will have to seek more understanding of how everything fits together and how it works. But I want to be able to say yes and try to do and live in what Jesus tells me to do or live in the promise that he makes for my salvation. So, for instance, right, in John chapter 20, verses 22 to 23, right, so here's one of our proof texts, right, the risen Jesus on Easter breathes the Holy Spirit on his apostles and he says, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you, right? That means that they are going to have the same mission that he has. Yeah. Right, and that he had, right, which is to, right, undo the works of the evil one, right, uh, to undo and defeat sin and its power, right, um, which both has to do with like the power of sin, like to compel us and draw us and move us, but also, right, it, the, the guilt, right, uh, that ruptures our relationship with God. Uh, and he says, right, I'm sending you out on the same mission, right, as the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. Receive the Holy Spirit. Whoever sins you forgive, they're forgiven them whoever sins you retain are retained. Now for a, for a lot of, um, uh, for a lot of people, right, they start off with the notion that I, I just, I just need the me and Jesus relationship. I don't need anybody else. And so it's hard to fit that in. And what I want to say first is, well, the, the first thing we ought to want to do is instead of saying, no, that's weird. That can't be because I already sort of know how it works. And to take that me and Jesus thing as sacrosanct and push off one of these things, push off these promises of God for the sake of, of, of keeping it that way. I want to try to have a mind and a theology that's open enough for Jesus to say that and for me to go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want that. He promised that this would, would happen, right? So I want to be able to have forgiveness of sins by right uh, receiving that through human mediators, through ministers. And then next I can ask, well, when? When do I need to do it? What circumstance? How does that relate to the rest of the atonement by Jesus? How does that relate to my personal private confession, right? I want to ask those questions next, but I don't want to let the answers I already think I know basically negate or neuter this promise of Jesus, because that happens in a lot of people's yeah. um, uh, lives. And then the second thing, um, we're talking about a sacrament as a visible sign, right? Um, right? throughout the Bible, but you can see it especially in the incarnation of Jesus, right? We're, we're, we're body soul creatures and we're made to be that way at the beginning. And when he returns, we're going to be body soul creatures again, right? When we're raised from the dead and our bodies are reconstituted, right? Uh, uh, as Jesus says in John five, right? Those who have done good will be raised to eternal life. And those who have done evil will be raised for judgment. Um, but everybody will be raised, Right? And uh, we're we're body soul creatures. We live in time. Right? I know some people who are like super philosophical type Christians, and they get kind of irritated at the <laughs> uh, at the Bible because they're like, "Why is there so much story?" And it's like, well, you live in a story. No matter how far you try to get your head in the clouds, you still live in a story beginning to end. <laughs> you still live in concrete relationships, and you still yeah. need things. And God knows that, and he condescends, just as he did in Jesus, right, to speak to us with a human mouth. Um, he still speaks through his apostles in this sacrament, we think, through a human mouth to convey his uh, great and wonderful forgiveness for the fresh times uh, when we offend him or break our relationship with him. So... That's it.
that's that's those are those are two things I would I would say to start that conversation. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's fantastic. Yeah, and that that's a such a chief difference, such an important difference between our understanding of you know how how God has how, you know how Jesus has established the, the Christian faith, right? And I think the important distinction to recognize that, like you mentioned, can you take me off those lenses and and okay. I, I see this thing in scripture. How do I recognize this, reconcile this? If you're wearing the lens that says, okay, my Christianity is just me and Jesus, which is a lens that, that many of us wore before becoming Catholic or before beginning that kind of journey to examine that, you know, the lens we are wearing, we, we'd see passages like you mentioned in John, right? Where we, you read that and kind of gloss over that. Well, I don't know what that means. That really fit into my preconceived notion of what my faith should be. So I'll just put it on the back burner and, and come back to it later. And later means kind of never, right? Until you really hit into something that you can't, you, know, you can't circumvent that, that idea any longer. I think for the most part, those kind of things are just kind of put aside. But like you say, you begin to say, okay, I'm going to approach scripture and read scripture. And if I, when I hit those things, I'm going to try and remove those glasses and wrestle with that thing as I see it there. Well, gosh, golly, you realize that Jesus is, is breathing on the apostles and g- giving them some kind of authority to, to, to bind and to lose. I remember encountering that idea in university in a you know, small student Bible study group and kind of going, wait a minute, why don't we, like, what, what happened to that? Why? Why don't we uh, share our, you know, share our, uh, our our sins with one another? And where did this authority to bind the loose sins go? Right? What, what what does that mean to retain sins? Or that was also so strange because my worldview didn't kind of fit those things in. But like you say, right? You would, okay, step back, look at this, and as you do in this book, look at this throughout the history, you know, throughout the whole narrative of Scripture. Right? And you begin to see a very compelling picture that, say, the Catholic Church has understood as it unfolded right? and had this practice of reconciliation in the sacraments, you know, going back to what Christ instituted. But, you know, there was obviously a rupture of that with the Reformation. And then me as an evangelical who just got a Bible and began to read it has no notion of, wait a minute, there's much more in here than I actually realized there was. And this was a, a, an older thing that was done for a lot longer than my more recent incarnation of, of Christianity. And, you know, begins back in, in Genesis, right? And, and kind of unfolds from there. I don't know if our best, you know, I, I've kind of uh, wrestled all day thinking this thing through how to, how, to, how to go, but I think maybe we could just begin to unfold some of this. We can't obviously hit every single part of this book. It's it's fantastic. And I encourage readers to pick it up immediately and, and pour over it. But this story begins in Genesis, right? Which is always a puzzling thing for, for many uh, people, Catholic, non-Catholic, Christian, non-Christian, to wrestle with this idea of, you know, the, the Garden Eden and, and sin being introduced and, and free will. And, and later on, this ties in with you know, reconciliation and, and confession and repentance. Um, can we go back to the beginning for a minute and talk about how the, the, the beginning of sin? Is that, is that, is it possible to start there? Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's a couple of things that are re- really, I mean, like everything in Genesis is foundational, right? Especially in those opening chapters. Um, <laughs> but, but if I could pick at least two <laughs> things that are really helpful for thinking about this sacrament um, and the specifics of it, um, I'd say that 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 um, the effects of sin are really visible in a, in a way that's uh, put into the narrative um, and the symbols of Genesis three, um, and then also God's response to sin and the kind of pattern that it sets for the rest yeah, of yeah, salvation yeah. history and the, and the pattern that's, that's opened back up again in a way in, uh, in the sacrament itself, um, especially in, um, I mean, there's, there's lots of ways to do it. And like I said, lots of ways that the sacrament has been done in like specifics, like who comes where and who sits where and, and whatnot. Um, but I, I, I do love when you appreciate it uh, well, um, uh, I do, I do, I do love the, the Latin rite or the, the Roman rite, that is to say. You say Latin rite anymore? Some people think that it, you, you're trying to say just the extraordinary form. I'm like, no, I just mean the, the Western, <laughs> the Western rite. Um, but, um, but yeah, you think about uh, the nature of sin and its effects, 
in Genesis 3, right? So here we are, we're in Eden, right? We have Adam and Eve together. And um, there's a really, uh, the catechism talks about these and there's a, there's a helpful book called Holy People, Holy Land by uh, Michael Dauphine and La Matthew Levering. Um, it's a really good like college textbook. I used to use it when I was teaching undergraduates um, that talks about the different harmonies that exist before the fall into sin. Right? There's a harmony between, first of all, between humans and God. And there's no sin to break their relationship as creator and creature, right? The, the, the creatures are happy to be creatures. They're happy to receive everything from God and also to do what he's called them to do, right? To name the animals, to care for the garden, to tend, you know, to care and love each other. Um, and then secondly, there's a harmony between, right, humans and each other, um, between humans and the rest of creation, uh, right? There's no breakdown. Everything everything is is made to to um, uh, uh, to be a home for life, right? And love and communion, and that's what it is. Um, and then also between between the human being and himself, right? Um, and when when uh, when Eve sees the tree, th questions the devil has asked it, it, the snake has invited her to question whether or not God has given this rule for their own good or just to like keep them down. Right. Did God really say, no, he knows that you're not going to die. He knows that if you eat it, you'll become like him. Right. Just, you'll be wise like him. And she looks at the tree. She's like, well, it's good looking. <laughs> it looks tasty. Right. So first John two 16 talks about, right. The delight of the eyes and desire of the flesh, right. Sensual pleasure, not, not, not always simply sexual, but sensual, right. Like, tasty right yeah, uh, wow. uh pleasure things like that and then pride right um uh, and these connect really nicely to genesis 3 as many of the church fathers have said um right she she's enticed by her desires for and uh, her sort of attraction to what's nice and especially like the pride of wanting to be like god in a way that god didn't make you to be like him right yeah. not wise in him but wise apart from him i can get a secret magic apple that will make me like my own God and I won't need him anymore. Um, and then when this happens, right, uh, the, those, those harmonies, those communions break down, right? Because Adam and Eve, right, quickly feel ashamed and they hide from God. They blame each other, right? Adam especially blames Eve, Eve blames the snake, right? And then when God pronounces the consequences of this, right? They're still, they still have their proper nature, right? As humans and, and even as men and women, uh, but, but it's going to, but it's now going to be broken, right? Things aren't going to work as well, right? The man will still till the garden, but the earth is going to like work against him and he's going to have to earn his food by the sweat of his brow, thorns and thistles, right? The woman will now have greater pain or significant pain in childbearing, right? They'll have conflict between each other, right? As has already started because they're blaming yeah, each other, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and, then, and then finally between uh, uh, the human being and himself, right? Uh, right? Uh, the people who are created to be body, soul, right? And to, to continue living because they eat from the tree of life, right? That's now going to break down your dust and to dust you will return. Right, and your body and your soul will be separated from each other in death. Um, and and so those are you can you can see here consequences of sin, right? Temporal ones, right? Ones that are for a short term, but then also eternal ones, right? That unless they get fixed, right, um, uh, uh, are are gonna are gonna end the human being being what God made him to be, body and soul, right, uh, forever. Um, and they hand this on then, they hand this circumstance on to every generation after that, right, in original sin. And everybody also inherits the concupiscence, right, the, the, the perversion of good desires that you can see Eve has when she looks at the tree, when she wants to taste it, when she whatever. And Adam's concupiscence as well, to want to choose his, uh, uh, the path of least resistance instead of saying, hey, wait a minute, babe, stop. Um, let's take a minute and step back. Uh, we can't forget Adam's role in this. Yeah, um, uh, and so so you can see all of this breakdown, but then you can also see God's character. Right, so He pronounces these consequences of sin. Right, so that like the sin sins have consequences, and there's no way around that. Right, but what's the first thing that He does after they've sinned? 
Is this a quiz? <laughs> I mean, I'll answer if you don't want to. <laughs> um, right, but they, they sin and they hide and they cover themselves with leaves. And then it says, God came down or yeah. God came and walked around in the cool of the day. Yeah. And he opens his mouth and he speaks. Right? The first thing God does to Adam and Eve after they sin is approach and then speak. And he invites them. He, he asks a question that points right to the thing that's gone wrong. And he says, hey, where are you? It's not because he doesn't know, right? Uh, we're, yeah, not gonna, yeah. we're not going to read the passage like that. But he's, he's pointing to the exact thing that's wrong and inviting them to confess. He does the same thing with Cain, right? After yeah, Abel is yeah, dead, God yeah, comes yeah. down and says, where's your brother? Right? Yeah, he knows. Yeah, right. You have this. You have this invitation yeah. right, to acknowledge the problem, and who knows, right? What would or wouldn't have been different um, in the story and the way that it played out had Adam said, "You know, drop down." Uh, the people listening on the podcast can't see me bowing down here on the, on the camera, um, right? But uh, had had Adam said, uh, "Dear God, I'm very sorry," right? I made a big oopsie, right? What he does yeah. instead is he blames God for giving this. Uh, he blames the wife for doing this, and he implicitly blames God for yeah. giving him this woman. The woman you <laughs> gave me, yeah. right? Adam's complaint. Um, uh, but 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 God comes and he invites the confession because he wants them after the relationship is broken to re-engage it. Right? Um, and that's really like ultimately at the end of the day, that's what the invitation to reconciliation is right that's what we ought to hear every time we see a sign posted with confession times or we see that green light on yeah, is yeah. this is god through the person of the priest who has this same mission right continued from jesus saying hey where are you come 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 talk to me right? yeah. don't keep walking away come re-engage the relationship right we'll fix the thing and then we'll start over again, right? And we'll start talking to each other again. Because what sin does is really it just breaks that relationship down. And because we're just like it does with other humans, except that with God, right? When we when we when we rupture in a small or certainly in, in a big way, right? Uh, definitely in, in big ways, when we rupture our relationship with God, right? We're rupturing our relationship with the source of life, perfection, immortality it, it himself, right? Yeah, yeah, that, that that's fantastic. You know, to to see the roots. I remember speaking to Dr. John Brugsma on the Old Testament roots of the priesthood. And he went back to Adam and Eve. Look, and look, here's how Adam was a priest, like the first priest. You know, to, to th this kind of treatment, like looking at reconciliation, th this beautiful sacrament again, like the like, like the priesthood, like, like holy orders, with roots. Gosh, in, in the very first, the, the entry of the narrative, like the beginning, the genesis of, you know, of salvation history, I, I think is fabulous to see that very kind of similar kind of framework. I think that's beautiful. And of course, we know then that these, these roots of reconciliation, of, the, of this sacrament, are then in kind of the rest of the narrative of the Israelites, you know, as, as th that, that people group grows, right, from Adam and Eve. I mean, gosh, if you, if you read the Old Testament, it, the pattern becomes quite clear of this uh, oopsies, you know, coming back to God, you know, some kind of penance oopsies, this, this over and over again kind of, kind of cycle. But, but I wonder where, where some parts where this is really kind of a clear example. Right? I, I can think of, you know, you touch on this too, the idea of the, the prophet that calls the group back to repentance, right? This I can I can see kind of already echoes God kind of coming down in the garden. You know where are you, right? Or, or, or you know, or you know, Cain, where's your, where's your brother? That kind of thing. Um, so I, I guess maybe a couple of highlights. Like where do we see that very clearly in the in the story of the Israelites? Then maybe kind of wandering uh, in that people group, kind of kind of growing. Where do we see the sacrament kind of echoed there? Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, there's a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. And it depends on the, the thing that you're looking for. Um, sure, yeah. Maybe we maybe we can do a couple of them. I mean, so one that's really really classic is David. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. And David's sin with Bathsheba and and against Uriah. Um, and uh, uh, and this I mean this is a this is a, a canonically classic example because it's in Psalm 51 and the church has prayed this at least once a week. Yeah. Since yeah. like forever, you know. <laughs> 
Um, uh, but right, David in Second uh, Samuel is uh, stay, stays home. Right, he doesn't go out with his uh, uh, warriors. Stays home, looks out, sees a pretty lady. Right now, notice. Right, remember, Eve saw that the tree was a delight to the eyes oh, yeah, yeah. and yeah. wanted to taste it. Right, and here David desires a similar kind of physical pleasure. Um, calls for her. We don't get a lot of detail about how the conversation goes, um, but but he's certainly abusing his power at the very least, right? It's hard to deny a king, even if yeah, you want to. Yeah. Um, uh, they commit adultery, right? Then he wants to cover up, right? So this is pride, right? This is the third thing. He wants to cover up his own sin uh, when he realizes that that they've conceived a child, right? And so he calls her husband back from the war and says, hey, why don't you go hang out with your wife? Yeah, why don't you, right? Hoping that nobody will notice, <laughs> right? And that the husband won't notice and everything will be fine. And then he 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 continues to choose sin into this spiral, right? Uh, blinded by his own pride, his own desires, right? Uh, his own um, self-justification. Um, uh, and ultimately, Uriah is a better man. Even after David's gotten him drunk, Uriah has more integrity drunk than David had <laughs> sober that day, right? Yeah. And and David gets mad and then has the guy um, uh, killed in battle. Uh, and then he, he takes the, the woman to be his own. And the prophet Nathan, right? So here, a mediator of God's word comes to David and to, through by the means of a little parable says, you have committed a great sin before the Lord. And when David hears that, when it's put in front of his eyes and he's finally convicted, he feels compunction, right? He, realizing that he's, he's, he's done wrong, feels bad about it, feels contrition, right? And sorrow over it. And he says, I have sinned. Right? And then Nathan says, take it up with God. No human being can, can, can uh, communicate the forgiveness of sins. No, Nathan says, the Lord has forgiven your sin, right? Right. He yeah. pronounces that to him, right, as a mediator. Right? But then he says, right, yet there will be consequences imposed by God and natural for what for what's happened, right? Uh, this the union here will not prove fruitful. You will have to start again for having children. And then he also says, right, the 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 natural, right, in world consequences of what you've done. What you've done is going to set a terrible precedent for your kids, and all of these sins will be sort of visited back on your household. Doesn't mean it won't uh, get redeemed later on, right? But these are non-eternal, temporal, temporary consequences for sin, and they're ones that David experiences in this life, right? Um, yeah. Uh, uh, but so we can we can see that same pattern there, right? And we can see in Psalm fifty-one, right, where this is put into a lyric form for us to pray with. Right? Um, and the church prays with this every Friday yeah. um, in the liturgy of the hours, um, right? David's saying, God, in your steadfast love and your mercy, right, please blot out my offense. I've sinned against you. And he asks also for the grace, not just to like have his slate wiped clean so that he can get away with stuff, right? but he says, create in me a clean heart. And he promises that he will, right, after he is restored, then offer God uh, the worship that right now in his state, he can't. Right? Um, and so you think about the pattern in uh, confession in Christ, right? Where because of Christ, right? Our sins are forgiven. Um, but but uh, along with that, right? When we receive the absolution, we also promise to right return to the worship of God in prayer or scripture reading or whatever penance it is that the priests uh, uh, give to us, right? We make that promise even before we hear the word of um, forgiveness uh, that we will re-engage this relationship, right? Um, and that's the that's the same kind of pattern that we're put in. And, and because of the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, and the sanctifying grace that God gives through the sacrament, through the words uh, of the priest, his mediator, just like Nathan, um, but even more than that, with the coming of the Holy Spirit through Christ, right? That sanctifying grace is given to really renew us and really create a clean heart, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Right, not just to wipe the sin off the slate; it does that definitely, but also to create a clean heart in us, so that we can re-engage the relationship with God and then and then live again with new strength. Yeah. Um, so that's the David one, and then uh, we could we could we could do lots of other ones too. I mean, did you did you have a favorite reading through the book? <laughs> 
I, no, I, most of mine are in the uh, are in the wilderness. But yeah, yeah, that, that, that's where the best ones are, I think, <laughs> tr- tr- truly. But there, yeah, I mean, there are no, there are so many. There's a thing, and gosh, I think just from that that higher view, that you know, that thirty thousand foot view, you can't not see that pattern, especially if you read. You know, uh, many listeners maybe have gone through Father Mike Smith's Bible in a Year, right, uh, podcast, and every day you're reading from different part of Scripture, or just, you know, re- read the Bible on a regular basis and go through the Old Testament kind of day by day. The, the, that kind of pattern is really unavoidable. It's in every, almost every figure of the Bible is a kind of tragic hero, right, who's, <laughs> who's done something terrible, Right, and then gone through that pattern of kind of repentance and uh, and reconciliation, and and that kind of the uh, you know you know restoration. There's so many examples of that. Um, I don't think I have a favorite. I I, I think David probably was my favorite, and you, you took him, Doctor <laughs> Prothro. Pro so um, I you know I don't know if you have another one that illustrates a different quality of that. I think the I think that penance angle is interesting because I think that that's, and we can circle back around to this in, in a few minutes, but thinking of how reconciliation is done kind of these days, contemporary, you know, how the Catholic Church kind of frames that sacrament, just the word penance is going to set off alarm bells, right? Well, why am I doing anything? Like, you know, God forgives me. I'm forgiven in the sacrament. Why am I having to do anything to in quotes, kind of, you know, air quotes for the podcast listeners, make up for that sin, right? Mm-hmm. Of course, that's a pattern, you know, we see in the Old Testament in the in the narrative there, right? So then, of course, th- there's a reason why it follows then in, in confession these days. But, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know if you want to, if this is a good point of stopping and, and talking with that, or if you have other examples from the Old Testament where that kind of pattern fits, I don't know. Yeah, no, what, I, what I, do you so think? that's that's great. I was thinking a second ago that that this is something that would be great to hit before we before we yeah, finish. So, yeah. um, uh, so two 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 principles that that I think can be useful here, um, and one of them is a, an Old Testament story, and then we'll also do some New Testaments. Yeah, right. Um, so this will this will this will do a little bit of both. <laughs> um, uh, but one story in the Old Testament that's that's really helpful here in Israel's wilderness wandering. Um, uh, is to to look at numbers, especially uh, chapters thirteen through seventeen. And so the children of Israel are wandering in the wilderness, uh, and they're headed to the promised land. And in chapter thirteen, right there, they're there, and they send out the twelve spies, and the twelve spies go out there for forty days, and then they come back, and the majority of them, instead of they say, "Yeah, that is a great land that God promised us," but the people are scary. Let's go back to Egypt, right? yeah. and they want to they want to reverse their redemption, right? And all of the the goodness that God has called them to, right? They want to go back to the thing that God tried to get them out of. Um, and uh, Moses falls down to intercede, uh, uh, and uh, God says, "Well, I'll I'll listen to you. I won't destroy the people utterly." Right. That's the that's the that's the fullest. Right. That would be like what we talk about the the eternal consequence of the sin. Right. That's the the the, the real thing that this deserves is actual just destruction. Um, where God says, "I won't do that. I'm going to convert this to a kind of mitigated punishment." Right. And it will be temporal and temporary. Right. Not eternal. And you're going to get forty years to wander in the wilderness. Forty years for the forty days that the people looked at my gift and then said no to it. Um, uh, cause it wasn't just the 10 spies. It was all the other people, except for a couple who said, let's go back to Egypt. So this is what God does. He imposes this penalty. Um, and we're, uh, uh, but it's, but it's not going to be eternal necessarily. Right. Uh, but this is the penalty that's imposed. It's a fitting kind of penalty and penance. But, but then you, you watch them through the rest of the 40 years. And number one, God takes care of them. He doesn't abandon them. Right. He takes care of them. And if you watch the, you know, the book of Numbers starts off with a census. That's what they call yeah. it, Numbers, right? <laughs> um, it's a hard book to start. And then once you get, is, get yeah. going, there's some interesting stuff. It, yeah. um, uh, uh, but if you come to uh, 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 about four-fifths of the way through Numbers, you're going to get some of the final reports before they get uh, right up to the cusp of the land and start Deuteronomy, where Moses gives his final address. Uh, and it, it gives the number of the people who are there. And it's still over 600,000 people, right? 
um, right? God has taken care of them. He has kept his promise to make a family for Abraham. He hasn't let their sins actually undo it, but he has also worked out a kind of just response and penalty, right? That corresponds to what they've done. Um, the next episode is the rebellion of Korah. And this is, this one's easily forgotten, but it's actually mentioned in the book of Jude in the New Testament as people who are like Korah are bad guys, right? Who are corrupting the church, Jude says, Jude verse 11. Um, and what happens with Korah, right? And the reason that, that it's important to remember that Jude says this too, is that right? God had said in Exodus 19, I have redeemed you, right? To make you a priestly people, right? And a holy nation, right? So all of the earth is mine, but out of all the peoples of the earth, you are my special possession and you will be like a priestly nation to me. Um, and then he, they sprinkle the blood of the covenant on them, ratifying them as God's people. He gives the Ten Commandments, yada, yada, yada. Right. And in the New Testament, this is uh, echoed, right, that what happens in Christ, that we are made God's people, his redeemed people, like in Christ, coming out of Egypt and headed for the promised land, right? This is all his grace. This is all of his goodness. Um, but that doesn't mean, sometimes people read, like, say, First Peter uh, chapters 1 and 2, where, where Peter references that and says, yeah, we're the priestly people, therefore we don't need priests or mediators, um, and first of all, you go, well, you needed somebody to tell you the gospel. Aren't they mediating in some way? Right. But they go, yeah, but we don't need priests. And you're like, okay, well, let's calm down. Right. <laughs> um, because, uh, right, with, with Korah's rebellion, what Korah says in Numbers chapter 16 is he says, you know what, Moses and Aaron, you've gone too far. All of God's people are holy. Yeah. Why are you acting all high and mighty like you've got a special job? And Moses is like, you think I want this job? Um, <laughs> yeah. Moses says, you, you've gone too far, right? We'll, we'll set up a test to see, right, who it is that God has chosen. Yeah. Um, uh, and then the, the ground swallows up Korah yeah. uh, and all of his company. Um, and then after that, the people still blame Moses. And then God sends another thing. And Aaron comes out to intercede for them. Uh, by making a sacrifice of incense. And it says, it's really arresting to me, it says that, it, that Aaron stood between the dead and the living because this plague, <laughs> right, was coming and Aaron yeah. ran out in front of it with this sacrifice yeah. and it hit everybody on the front side of Aaron. And then once it hit Aaron, it just dissipated and it wow. didn't hit anybody anymore. Um, uh, and so, right, First Peter is able to say the same thing of the church, as, he sa as God said of Israel, you're a priestly nation, right, a holy nation. As a whole, the whole people intercedes before the rest of the world toward me and mediates my goodness, right? Yeah. But that doesn't mean that in Israel there weren't supposed to be priests, right? And God makes this clear, this is the showdown with Korah. And Jude says, yeah, you need to pay attention to that story because Jude in the New Testament says, don't be like Korah. Um, and so we, uh, and you can, you can see, right, Paul acting with authority, right, in, in different places. Paul telling people in 2 Corinthians to, to reconcile with a brother who has sinned and has been under punishment, he says, quote unquote, his punishment is enough. Reaffirm your love for him, right? So on Paul's authority, they're supposed to make nice with a guy who a few weeks ago was excommunicated. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. And, and if, if that, that's not something that can be democratized, it's just not practicable. Right. Cause there's lots of people in Corinth who still don't like the guy. Right. Yeah. So somebody has got to do this. Um, so the buck has to stop somewhere. Right. And in that case, in those congregations, it stops with Paul cause he's their, you know, um, uh, missionary apostle, right. He's like a bishop. Um, so that's, that's one thing I would say, right. Is that in the new Testament, right. Uh, uh, it's not as though in the old Testament, we need a priest in the new Testament. We don't, right. We have a high priest, but in him, we have many others who mediate, right. And who stand in for him. And lots of people do that in different ways, right. I do that with my children. You do that with your kids, right. Moms do that too, right. They represent Christ, uh, as well, right? Everybody who's in Christ in one way or another represents Christ, but some people are called and selected and consecrated to a special right, type of role and vocation in representing him to the rest of the church and within the church. Um, so we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, 
right? Um, we don't want to become clericalists who are like, well, I'm a lay person, what can I do, right? I don't represent Jesus at all, who cares? I just pay, pray, and obey. Um, but we also don't want to go the other way and, and democratize everything because that's what Korah did and Jude says, don't. <laughs> Um, and then the second thing is, is that right coming into the New Testament, one might say, well, so here's Jesus who has atoned for the sins of the world, and he very much has. Um, therefore, right, no, nothing that I that I do is even joins up with that. Right? Yeah. But then you run into you run into other tr uh, troubles in the New Testament, right? And the reason that Catholic theology is the way that it is is that we're trying to we're trying to say yes to a whole bunch of different passages instead of saying yes to some and then saying I don't know that's weird about yeah. others. <laughs> yeah. Right? So like when Jesus says, right, if you don't forgive other people, you won't be forgiven, and you yeah. go, oh, right, in 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 Mark eleven or Matthew six, it's the only petition of the Lord's Prayer that Jesus stops in Matthew to say, let me clarify this. I mean yeah. this. <laughs> yeah. So. Right after the prayer, he does that. Um, uh, places where Jesus says, "Right, uh, you guys are you guys are full of uncleanness on the inside." In Luke eleven, give alms. Yeah. And everything will be pure for you, right? The alms giving will purify you. And you're like, but I thought I was purified by the blood of Christ. Well, you are, but when you do these things, right, in Christ and with the power of the Holy Spirit by His grace what we do gets to take part in right and be joined to Jesus' sacrifice and it and it has effects on our uh, uh our own temporal experience of the consequences yeah. of yeah. our sin yeah. right um and and that's why we uh why we talk this way about like we don't mean atoning for sins like we have completely done something that utterly makes up for it right what we mean is that god has right uh forgiven the eternal consequences of sin Right. And there are still right uh, uh, temporal, temporary, not eternal um, uh, punishments and judgments that will come either naturally or imposed by God. Uh, but that our, our response to Christ can actually affect how we live within that. Right. Paul talks about um, uh, bearing in his or Paul talks about in his own body suffering for the sake of Christ's body. And he says, yeah. uses a phrase that, that can be difficult for everybody, Catholics too, right? Filling up what's lacking in the sacrifice of Christ or the suffering yeah. of Christ. Yeah. Um, but that's that's one that we don't want to just say, well, who knows, right? And pass on. We want to try to understand that. Paul talks about um, suffer, we will be glorified with Christ if we suffer with him now in Romans 8, 17, right? He says in Romans 8, 13, We've been freed from sin and its power, so we're not debtors to obey or serve sin anymore. If you do, you'll die, right? He's telling people who've already, right, he's already said, have been saved by the grace of Christ, right? He says, if you, if you sink yourself into life of the flesh again, you'll die. But if you put to death, and the Latin word for that is mortify, right? If you put to death the desires or the deeds of the body, by the power of the Spirit, not on your own power, but by the power of the Spirit and God's grace working in you, you will live, right? And so this is how we are called to not do it on our own, right? Not to say Jesus did half and I'll do the other half, right? He did everything. But part of the everything that he did was right, win this grace for us so that we can actually be transformed, right? And that we can um, uh, 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 play, play, a, play a minor supporting role because he loves to see his kids yeah. act out in his play, right? Yeah. Play a minor supporting role that he's called us to in this. And so when we think about penance, um, right? This is the context it fits in. It's not just like self-flagellation or like, yeah. well, the more yeah. bad I can make myself feel like we're just trying to trump up shame or something like that, right? It's actually about learning how to mortify, put to death those desires, right? Of the flesh by maybe fasting, maybe almsgiving, and then especially through prayer and re-engaging our relationship with God, yeah. right, where we can actually uh, 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 more and more be what he's called us to be, right, and live by the power of the Spirit, right, to suffer with him that we might be glorified with him, to re-engage our relationship with him and become imitators of the Father who loves so much and forgives so much. <laughs> That's fantastic. And I know I don't want to go too far aside here. We're getting close to the end of our time, but I know you've written books on justification as well. Look, and this is a great topic, I think, to tie in here for a second here. I don't, I don't want to get you going on a different topic. 
and I'm very excited about this topic as well. So we could just go on for, for ages. But there is such a fundamental difference in my mind between the perspective of many uh, you know, non-Catholic Christians who might say, you know, my sins, when I pray to Jesus, when I, when I become Christian to begin with, give my life to Christ, begin that relationship, you know, and or or ever come back and ask God to forgive me, those sins are kind of covered over, right? They're they're not they're not gone away. Christ just looks away, right? It's that 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 judicial fiction idea, right? Of in the court of law, those sins will be ignored by God. Like the the, the Catholic difference, and you know better than I do how to articulate this, probably Doctor Pro though, right? Is that transformative grace though in that? in that repentance, in that turning from sin, right? And that for me is a big difference. And I think my listeners, I think that's worth for a second at least highlighting that that's the, the difference in my mind with reconciliation as it is in the sacramental form, right? Is that Christ is calling us to, to be transformed, to actually become that kind of sinless, right? Person, live that life, rather than just having my sin kind of ignored or covered up, right? And I'm still kind mm. of that wretched person, and I'm still, you know, not 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 great. There's a big difference there in Catholic theology. I, I think does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. And it's um, uh, we we want to avoid the um uh, like overcorrection, right? So there's like lots of stuff in the Bible about like yeah. just forgiving, like canceling the debt, right? Or God turning away his face from sins or, or covering over, right? The word language for atonement is about covering. Yeah. Um, and so we, we don't want to deny that, right? Um, forgiveness of sins is a big deal. Um, but we also don't want to deny and we want to emphasize that it comes along with, just like what you were saying, right? It comes with um god 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 giving us the gift to actually to actually transform us right so that we're not left in our sins but counted differently we're also even more than that right we're forgiven and then we're also sanctified right and that that's actually part of the process of salvation if we and there's a there's a number of angles we can look at this from but i mean one of them is just thinking about what salvation is right if 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 the issue of salvation really is uh right analogous to a bouncer at a club deciding whether your name's on the list or not, then that's all I need, right? All I need for salvation is to be able to know that there's a way in which God has put my name on the list, right? And he does, right? He writes this in the book of life, right? That's there. But right, actually getting in, right? When we think about heaven, we think about salvation, we think about what God made us to be, right? I mean, God kind of loses if he made us to be like him and then we just never are, but he decides he'll let us hang out in the house anyway. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Right? No, but this is a massive plan B situation, if that's yeah. the case, right? But if what God can do through the Holy Spirit, right, in this life, and then if anything still needs to be done afterward, too, if what God can do is actually purify us and actually right make us like him and the way we're supposed to be as creatures, right? Um, like back in Adam and Eve, right? Then, then that's 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 like the end goal of salvation, right? Yeah. To become like Him, right? And His nature is love. So again, going back back to penance, right? All of our self denial is not just meant to be beating ourselves up, right? Or like a divine diet with fasting or something like that, right? It, it's actually meant to train us to say no to our own selfish desires, so yeah. that we can say yes to God and others, right? And that's love, right? That's part of us being. Right. In little ways, little ways in this life being transformed to be like him, to be what he made us to be. Um, and so, uh, you know, and, and in that context, right, um, then Christian sin is still a problem, even when it's even even when you haven't broken your relationship off with God. Right. Even little ones. Right? So going back to like taking God at his promises. Um, right. All the places where Jesus says, right. Right, uh, 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 that this or that or the other thing, right? Having mercy on others will, right, um, uh, uh, will engender more mercy toward you, right? Forgiving others will engender forgiveness toward you. Yes, all these sorts yes, of things. Yeah. Um, and he's not talking about God being withholding, right? But he's talking about like, well, listen, if you're like, you, you're either on this train or not, right? <laughs> either forgiveness transform your life 
so that you're forgiving or it doesn't, right? Like the parable of the unforgiving servant, right? Who's forgiven you know, like a continent, right? 10,000 talents and then won't forgive somebody else a few months wages. Um, uh, but in in First John 5, right? Uh, John says, if you see a brother, right? So a brother, a fellow Christian, right? Sinning a sin that's not unto death. You're like, okay, this is not unto death. So it's not that bad. We just whoosh, be fine. He says, ask God and God will give that person life. You're like, wait a minute. I thought he had enough life. Isn't he in? Isn't he a Christian? Isn't he what? And it's like, well, no. It, it, but but if the goal is to become like Christ, right? Yeah, then yeah, all of the ways yeah. that we're not like Christ, they're not a problem like you need to go lacerate yourself or something like that. But they are a problem yeah. for reaching our ultimate goal, right? And, and interceding for each other. Right? And then also, especially right um, in the sacrament of confession, right, is, is meant to deal with that. And then so is the rest of our life of piety. The catechism, I forget the paragraph, but it's in the section on penance. Um, the, the catechism talks about this and it says in this way, every sincere act of devotion is part of our life and forgiveness of sins. Right? Not because we're earning it for ourselves, but because it's part of us being purified of right? What's still earthly, what's still selfish in us, right? What we need to put to death, right? And every sincere yes to God is also a no, just in the same way that, that our penances, our no's to ourself are training for saying yes to God. Every sincere yes to God in true devotion and love towards somebody else is also saying no to the sinful desires that I have, right? Yeah. That want to direct me to do something else. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's fantastic. Okay. I, I think that this is maybe, I don't know the most important thing, but the words like mediator, words like intercession or intercede, those are those great big kind of alarm bells going off words for uh, the non-Catholic Christian who hears those things and goes, aha, I got you. Like you're putting a thing in the way of Jesus that shouldn't be there, right? Jesus forgives the sins. Why, why would I ever have to do anything other than just pray and ask for forgiveness? And it's done, poof, it's done, right? You, we talked earlier in the, this conversation about, well, we see the risen Christ breathing in his apostles, giving them the power to bind and loose, right? We know that the early church understood that quite clearly as this thing that passes on and keeps going. It doesn't just end when the apostles die. We can flesh that out maybe in a second. And then I think to the, you know, as a, as a Catholic, as someone who became Catholic and who used to, you know, in my bedroom, in my, in my dorm room, kneel, in, in, you know, kneel, on my bed in my dorm room and ask for forgiveness from Jesus and kind of hope that I was forgiven. That experience, that, that physical experience mm -hmm. of that versus a sacramental going in and talking to a priest who I believe is in succession from those apostles, who I see in scripture is given the ability to bind and loose those sins, who uses the words that Christ put into his mouth to say, hey, by the way, you're forgiven here. That, that experience, the physical experience, that's an apologetic all unto itself. Because that, ex that experience is so fundamentally different. But those words, right, those words, mediator, intercessor, the fact that that priest is saying those things at all are, are alarm bells. So we've talked about, right, where that is in scripture, that those roots. But that was, you know, that wasn't as if we're reading that wrong 2000 years later, right? The early church received that and understood that quite clearly and began to, to practice those sacraments like reconciliation under that authority uh, that uh, the apostles passed on, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, you're you're going to find this th throughout, right? You, you, don't, you don't have a period in the early church or you don't really have like pockets of people in the early church, right? Heretical Orthodox. Um, uh, uh, at least after after a century, so you, you don't really have any pockets of the early church that any Protestant Christian today or Catholic would say, yes, that's the church uh, who isn't affirming this, right? Uh, the, either the reality of like the need for penance, right, to to become uh, what God has made us to be um, in salvation, or denying the reality of uh, people who are intercessors mediators or go-betweens and one of the one of the issues here also comes in with um uh like what these words mean right because yeah. sometimes the words they like they, they take on their own meaning in history with within the catholic church and then they take on a new meaning in some of the apologetics right um uh so um 
right? When, uh, uh, right, there's one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ, right? As St. Paul says, yeah. and, and, and that's true, right? If you mean mediates heaven to earth, right? He's the bridge between heaven and earth. He's the only God man, right? He's the only one through whom we can actually be joined to the divine nature again, as second Peter talks about salvation, um, right? He's the only one. Right? And it's only in him that anybody else can do any good mediating. Right? But in him, they do. Right? In him, Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, don't get to, you don't get to jump straight. You have to imitate right, the people who are in front of you as examples. Right? Um, uh, John, uh, in 1 John, right, says, what we have seen, what we've touched, what we've heard, we proclaim to you. This is the word of life. We proclaim it to you so that you can have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. Right? Right? They, in, if you take this, the word mediator to mean right, somebody who right, makes a bridge between one person or another, right? you can't mediate somebody else straight to God the Father, right? but, but you can be the bridge between somebody else and Christ. Right? Yeah. This happens all the time in evangelization. Right. Lots yeah. of our evangelical friends would say, go out and do mission. Why? Well, because somebody needs to go tell them. Well, why do they need that? Well, because somebody needs to make the connection here. Right. Um, and you can do that, in fact, with your mouth. Right. Uh, as uh, as they as as one does in sharing the gospel. And as we believe priests do with their mouth in the confessional. Uh, and you can also do it with your mouth or your mind or heart in prayer. Right. And it doesn't mean that you can't kneel down next uh, on your bed and and s confess your sins you should do that right and 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 again going back to the liturgy of the hours right this is something that's built into the yeah, should yeah, be built yeah. into the church's prayer life every night yeah, right yeah. is an examination of conscience and right a request for god's forgiveness right that's a that's a good thing right this is a sacramental expression of that it's not the only place you can ever go to confess your sins right um uh, and so again we want to avoid the like over overreaction right yeah, where like yeah. one group says never say anything to a priest or another human being and then another person says yes only confess your sins to the priest because otherwise who cares it's no it won't count it's like well no no no. god god likes to hear his kids talk to him about their stuff all the time but he promised that he would especially work in this way and we want to take god at his promises and say yes um i will go avail myself of that because he promised a gift right uh, it's not a greater um uh, uh, it's 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 not a greater act of devotion to God to say, you know what, God, I believe in you so much, I don't need that thing that you gave me that was supposed to be helpful to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. That would actually be a little bit impious because it would be implying that he didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> um, you know, and with and uh, so mediate, right, right, to be able to do that and intercede, same way, right, to to step in for somebody else. But that's literally like intercede right if we're um uh, uh if we're scared of the latin word um uh, just jump over to first john 5 and you can see it happening right or you can see it commanded right where john says if you see a brother committing a sin yeah, yeah, yeah. ask god and god will give him right that the brother committing a sin life right? yeah right he's telling you to do so right james 5 confess your sins to one another and pray for one another Right, that you may be healed. Right? Now that can have expression in the uh, sacrament in particular, but it also right is what we ought to be doing for each other anyway. And and lots of people do this, you find, but they're allergic to the term mediator or intercede, like you said, right? Because they 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 think that that means that you yeah. made Jesus superfluous, right? Yeah. But the only way that any of this happens is in Christ. But we do think that he Christ has called us to do this and invited us to do this and made a promise to listen to us when we do. Otherwise, First John 5 wouldn't be there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I guess what vexed me way back when in university, when I first encountered this idea of, you know, the apostles being given that power to bind and loose, I went, okay, there's nothing at all that looks like this in my experience of Christianity. Mm -hmm. It wasn't as if there was anything even remotely similar. So maybe the Catholics are doing it wrong in, in you know, in, in putting a guy in a booth and having you confess your sins to him. But there was nothing that remotely corresponded with that, in my experience of Christianity. So the Catholics, either they were doing it wrong, or doing something more right than we were doing, because we had nothing 
nothing at all like that, right? But as you say, you know, in the beginning of this episode, it's a, it's really a matter of kind of look taking those glasses off and reading scripture for what's there, not trying to shoehorn your ideas of scripture into it, right? Not approaching with with the solution already in mind, but looking at that kind of afresh and going, okay, what is there's something here. Now, how do I understand this, right? And I think connecting that as you've done so eloquently to the history of, or the, the, the total, the totality of scripture, Old Testament and new, right? The history of God's plan of salvation, looking at something like reconciliation, confession, this, this sacrament in that context, well, gosh, that's a, <laughs> it's pretty eye-opening. You've done a fantastic job highlighting that. And I think it's a pretty interesting thing to kind of reflect on, okay, maybe I don't understand what this is, you know, uh, uh, apart from this sacrament that, that, that's going on here. I think it's definitely something that's that's really interesting. Uh, so thanks. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for bringing that out so well. <laughs> I think that's awesome. Um, I do want to say thank you for being here, uh, also for this wonderful book. And I guess ask you, where do you want to point? I'll put, you know, I'll put links in the show notes for the show to where people can, can find this book from Baker Academic. It's it's incredible. I, really, it is. It's wonderful treatment of the subject. So thank you for, for doing that. I'll put links in the show notes to that. Anywhere else you want to point them towards to find or follow you or uh, things you think would, would benefit them to take a look at? What, what, and I'll put those links in the show notes. Where, where else? Where, where else can they go? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, okay, there's a... Um, Lots of things. <laughs> so I'm. Uh, 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 I can be. I. I. I don't really. I'm not good at tweeting. Um, but I can be followed <laughs> on there, and sometimes good thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, but they're usually small updates. But I. Um, uh, uh, my, the things that I'm publishing can be followed on um, academia.edu. Just yeah. search James B. Prothrow. Yeah. Um, I would. Uh, uh, there's there's a lot of good resources on confession depending on the the particular question that you've got um uh my secondary thing that i'll mention first um is a is a good book on the sacrament of Re reconciliation um by a guy named uh, fastigi it's an italian name so the two g's at the end um and if if somebody's interested in like the the history of this and how it how it how it looks right like he's only got like you know 20 pages on bible but then he goes through kind of the history of the sacrament yeah, yeah, through its yeah. developments um in a really accessible way um that's also intelligent and well documented um that that's really really helpful um but i would i would also encourage people to um read the following um second corinthians 5 right, where paul talks about God not reckoning our trespasses and also talks about right, the need to be reconciled to God and us becoming the righteousness of God. And then into chapter six, where he says, don't receive the grace of God in vain because you can. Right. right. So, so, so be, be, a, be about it. Um, I'd encourage people to read the gospel of Luke, um, the parable of the prodigal son, yeah. especially. And if somebody's, if somebody, if, if somebody doesn't, feel and know, right, the, the love of God to come and embrace them, read the parable of the prodigal son and think real hard about everything that's happening. And then think also about what does the prodigal son need to do the next morning when he wakes up? Right? <laughs> he's come back to the house. He's come back to the family, right? If all he wanted was, you know, forgiveness to enable his continued lifestyle, he would never have come home. So he comes home, he's at the feast, but he's got to talk to mom. He's got to talk to his brother. He's got to be reconciled, yeah, not just yeah, with yeah. the father. He's got to be reconciled with the rest of the family. Otherwise, he hasn't actually come home. Yeah, right? And that's what we want to do in confession is not just to get right the okay slip, not just to get the cancellation of the debt, but actually to come home and to re-engage yeah, that relationship. Yeah. And that's why sometimes our penances are to talk to mom. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes they're to read scripture. Sometimes mm. it's, you know, something else that the priest will suggest to you. Yeah. Um, uh, but, um, and, and for somebody in their devotional life, I would, I would just say, sit with Psalm 51. There's Psalm 32 is great. Um, uh, uh, there's lots of other ones, but um, but sit with Psalm 51, right? And 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 know and feel and say with your heart, right? The desire both for forgiveness, 
the confession of contrition, right? And that we're sorry for our sins that we know that we need, um, uh, uh, we need continued mercy from God. Um, and the request also for um, a, a new heart that the Holy Spirit gives us in Christ um, and the, the promise to, uh, uh, to offer true sacrifices once we're reconciled, right? And to tell others about it yeah. as well, right? A generation yet unborn, I will announce uh, this to them and, and, to, and to sit with that. So that's, I mean, I, like there's lots of other books and I, I mentioned Fastigi. <laughs> I think mine is pretty good, or at least it was helpful good. What, I, good. what I meant to write it for. I'm glad that you like it too. <laughs> but, um, but, but really those, those passages in scripture are some really, really great ones um, to, to know the love of God and then also hear his call to like actually come home and be part of the family. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. I'll put links to those things uh, in the show notes. Those recommendations. That's that's wonderful, Doctor Proto. This has been an awesome conversation. Uh, thank you. I want to say God bless you and the work you're doing uh, for the church in this stuff. It's it's awesome. Thanks for being here. Uh, this has been a real thrill. Appreciate uh, it. Thanks so much for having me, and thanks for the work that you do. Thanks. Thanks so much.